And so I think you're going to really enjoy it. I suggest you take notes. He's going to give us his uh, over his slides, but I would still say take notes, right? Because sometimes there's a little tidbit that's not in the slide or whatever. Um, so I'll go ahead and let him introduce himself the rest of the way. It's Dr. Dale Alander. Thank you. So can you tell me again what time we uh, what time we are closing down? We have a full hour. So an hour to present and fifteen minutes for questions. questions. Okay, great. All right. Um, all right. Good morning, everybody. Um, so just to say to get us started off, um, the presentation that I'm going to give is in parts interactive, and what I want you to do is think about the things that I am doing with you as instructional strategy. So I'm going to talk about this notion of achievement in a different way. I'm not necessarily going to talk about achievement gaps and so forth. We will a little bit, but mostly I'm going to uh, present some, some principles and perspectives and, and some instructional stra uh, strategies. Right? You all thinking about education, counseling, where are you headed? How many are going to go into a credential program at some point? Okay, About a third almost. Uh, counseling. Okay, uh, nursing. Okay, what else? What else am I missing? Social work. <laughs> Social work. Okay, excellent. All right. So, really, in, in in all of those fields, the things that I'm going to share with you are going to be um, applicable. All right, that I'm going to share with you verbally and otherwise. Uh, I teach four different classes here at Sac State. One is an educational foundations. One is a, a literacy course. Uh, another is a fundamentals, and then another is a, a seminar course. And in every one of the classes that I teach, whether I'm co-teaching or by myself, I begin in this way, all right? Uh, I begin by some mindfulness practices and some grounding. Um, there's a lot of stuff that gets lodged in our bodies before we get into the classroom. A lot of stuff that is distracting us. One theme that I want to leave you with to begin, and then I'll end as well. Your thinking is only about 2% conscious. 98% of your thinking and your thoughts are going on in the background, in your unconscious mind. And that stuff influences that 2% and then the behavior that comes thereafter. Okay? So if you only have 2% of your thinking conscious. I have less than that, instructionally. I have less than 2% of your attention. And that's at any given time, no matter what endeavor we're engaged in. So we have to think about educating that 98% as well. So this is how we start that way. OK, everybody up, please. Face me, but try to not. Uh, Make sure you have some arm's length from each other. OK? You shouldn't, shouldn't be touching or banging in. And you're staggered there, so you should be OK. All right? This is a Qigong practice. OK? I want you to put your hands just below your belly button. You're not going to interlace. Just rest one on top. Loosen your knees a little bit, OK? This is part of the lecture, all right? You're going to drop the bottom one. And when you go up, you breathe in. And when you go down, you breathe out, like this. Let me start, and then follow me. Let's go. Rest it on top and bring the other one up. Rest it on top and bring the other one up. One more time. Come on, man. More vigorous. <laughs> there you go. Everybody doing this? 
Everybody's arms are up, 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 unless there's some reason that you're not able to. I understand that. And check this out. Have a seat, please. <clears throat> All right. So it's a large room. When I try to call folks' attention, remember, these are all strategies and practices, OK? Some of you who are want to go into nursing, you might be doing public health and have to give a broader presentation. And it might not, you know, might need to pull folks' attention in. So when I say the word, I'll go, everybody shouts back, I may. Let's try that three times. You with me? I'll go. Amen. That's a good start. I go. Amen. Getting better a third time. I want to hear everybody all the way here. Ready? I go. Amen. All right. That means I have something to say. I want you to hear me. And that means back, we're ready to listen. But the idea is that it comes from the collective. So my man in the uh, hat and the glasses all the way over there, what's your name, sir? Gray. Gray. If you wanted our attention, you'd have to do the same thing, even if I'm speaking. I want you to try it three times. Shout it out. I go from you. I go. I may. You don't have them yet. Do it again, please. I may. I may. So it can come from me. It can come from any one of you at any point in the conversation. All right? So let's talk about the content a little bit. Uh, here's my contact information. I always start off doing that. Um, I don't mind if you tweet during the process. I do work with some folks who say technology off during presentations. Um, it's a hard thing to compete with, so I'd rather incorporate it into what I'm doing. So um, if you need to get in touch with me at some other point because of something I said or something you were interested in, or what have you, there you go. And then the last thing is my, my website address. It's not super up to date. It needs some editing. But uh, there are a lot of videos and images of the work that I do that you might be interested in seeing. All right. Take a look at these. First bullet is from the 10-point platform from the Black Panther Party's 1966. 50 years later, from the Movement for Black Lives, or you might know it as Black Lives Matter, from their policy platform. They say, we want decent education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. That was the demand, the concept behind it. We believe in an educational system that will give our people a knowledge of the self. Okay. If you do not have knowledge of yourself and your position in society and in the world, then you will have little chance to know anything else. All you need to know about the achievement gap is right there. Now, there's a lot more we can say about it. There's a lot more we can say about it in terms of the research, in terms of people's narratives, et cetera. But understand some of those principles right there. 50 years later, Black Lives Matter says, we want a curriculum that acknowledges and addresses students' material and cultural needs, physical activity, and recreation. Wow, recreation. Why, why should we think about that in education? It's necessary. Movement is why, the way we started this activity. Because remember, we're trying to get at not just the 2% of the attention that I have. We're trying to get at the 98%. And what you do with your body is educating that other 98%. All right, so I begin there as a place for us to muse and process as we go through the presentation, all right? We did our Qigong, where my work comes from. Um, I am a faculty member here, assistant professor. Happy to be here. I had a whole lot of other trajectories and things that I did before that. But currently, in addition to my work here, I do a lot of work with the National Urban Alliance 
and their notion of pedagogy of confidence. I want you to know that some of the theorists that they're drawing from, uh, Reuven Feuerstein, and I want you to know that Reuven Feuerstein says, and this is the belief that guides much of my practice, and it will tell you how to combat the achievement gap, and that is that no matter what the physical, cognitive, emotional, social barriers are to someone's learning, Feuerstein has shown with his research that everyone can surpass and achieve high academic levels, no matter what the experience is that has caused the student to not be able to do that at the moment. His work was initially with children who were taken from their parents during the Holocaust, and then post-Holocaust, they were deemed uneducable because they were not engaged in schooling at all. Feuerstein's research said, well, they've been traumatized, for one, and they've been removed from their culture. And your culture is your whole physical brain apparatus that allows you to see what's going on in the world and to understand it and to situate yourself in it. Kind of like those two tenets from the Black Panthers and Black Lives Matter said, knowledge of self. They didn't have that. Feuerstein later worked with Down syndrome children and also saw significant, significant academic gains. Feuerstein worked with children who were at one point mute, who later began to speak and read and complete a college education in a short time frame because they had spent considerable amount of time without speaking. So that's a, that's a, a, a cornerstone belief of all the practice that I do, all right? Uh, Asa Hilliard, who has a similar perspective, uh, African American, much more critically and race oriented, Paulo Freire, you should know about, who was a Brazilian educator, probably one of the most widely known and influential um, in this hemisphere, certainly. Uh, Yvette Jackson, who's coined the term pedagogy of confidence and who is uh, the senior scholar in residence for the National Urban Alliance. So that's the sort of, from a, a, a broad perspective there. But also work that I do in the Aseo Area School District. Um, specifically today, some of the stuff is going to come from work that I do there. Um, but I actually do quite a bit of work all around the Minneapolis-St. Paul area right now, currently. Um, the Twin Cities, as they're called. Anybody familiar with that area of the country? Yes? Anybody else? Anybody been there? It's cold there, right? It um, cold. But it's a very vibrant place. Very vibrant place. Um, at any rate, the state of Minnesota has been um, dealing with resistance to desegregation since Brown versus Board. And they've been doing that. You know what I mean when I say Brown versus Board? Yes? OK. Some nods over here. You all? You with me? Brown versus Board of Education? OK. Well, they have not complied. And they've been fighting it in courts ever since. How long ago was Brown versus Board? Anybody know? 65, 63. It's a long time, right, to be resisting this. Among other things, and the only reason that they, that, that they are actually trying to move to some compliance is the NAACP has had them in court since about 1970, right? Well, one thing that they do is that uh, they've entered into a voluntary desegregation zone, and that's all of the schools surrounding the Twin Cities. And so I've worked in and out of a number of those districts, and Aseo area schools is one area. The schools in that region are very interesting. I like to call them African diaspora schools because in addition to the African American population that's there, they have the largest Somali population anywhere outside of Somalia, large Nigerian population, large Ethiopian population. But in addition to that, they have a large Hmong population and a whole series of other European immigrants as well. Yeah. So it's very vibrant culturally, right? Um, the other thing I'm going to draw from today is the work of George Lakoff uh, in his work in neurolinguistics. Neuro, right? The neurons, the brain. We're going to talk about that just a little bit. And again, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, you know teaching tolerance? 
Anybody? I know you're not all necessarily teachers, but you, some of you all do. Uh, it's a great resource. It's free. Everything that I reference that comes from them will be um, available on their website to download and take a look at. And I'll tell you that it's going to get political when I get down here, okay? The whole thing is political, mind you, right? But it's going to get more political down here, all right? Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center is the, one of the, parent, is the parent organization of teaching tolerance, but they also have two other branches. One is called the Intelligence Report, okay? The Intelligence Report is a project by the Southern Poverty Law Center where they literally uh, research and document down to the zip code hate groups around the country, all right? The other thing they do, they're a law center. They take those hate groups to court, and they do that with the sole purpose of suing them to the point of bankruptcy so they can break them down. They've taken the Klan to court. They've taken school districts to court. At one point, the Klan firebombed their offices to try to prevent them from following through with the resources, or the, the, the lawsuit, right? So they're a, they're a, a, a real intense organization, and um, they offer tremendous amount of free resources. And I'm going to highlight some of what they're talking about later on. But I, I, I list that stuff just so you understand a little bit about where my uh, sources are coming from, OK? So we start with three critical understandings. The first is that intelligence is modifiable. Intelligence is modifiable. All right? I go. Amen. What's the first bullet? Is modifiable. What's that first bullet? We do that re several times because repetition is really important. If I said it one time, some of you will get it. If I say it again, some of you might get it. But if you all say it, more of you will get it. And then one person says it. And then you get that a little bit more so. It takes hold of your brain a little more so. But that's an important concept. And that comes not just from Feuerstein's work. Because Feuerstein, by the way, uh, was a student of Piaget, and you know that name, right? right? So the work that I do with the National Urban Alliance, I like to say it has a direct lineage to Piaget's work. But that concept is also important now since those days because what we know about uh, plasticity, right? Brain plasticity. Then you go into the second bullet. All students benefit from a focus on high intellectual performances. Why would we say that? We would say that because although not all students are, are operating at the same level, they're not performing at the same level, they have the same set of hardware as everybody else. You've got the same amount of neurons, same structures in the brain. They're encoded differently, certainly. But because of all of that, sometimes in an effort to assist a student, a school will give them something that's, you know, quote, easier. Yeah. They might say, well, this is differentiation, or well, this is what they can handle. But what happens is that the brain only grows to the heights that you give it. And the brain wants complex, puzzling, challenging things to do. A lot of the achievement gap is because students aren't given enough challenging work in a culturally relevant manner, so they get bored and they check out. And the checkout factor may be sleeping in the corner. It may be causing a disruption. All right? So you've got to focus on high intellectual performances, but you've got to do it in culturally relevant ways. Right? The last one is that language, or learning is influenced by culture, language, and cognition. Culture, language, and cognition. And I'll talk about how those are interwoven as we get going. I'll go. Amen. You with me? All right. So Pedagogy of Confidence. This is Yvette Jackson's book where she uh, basically synthesized a lot of her work. Um, she was, at one point, the director uh, for Gifted and Talented Education for New York City Public Schools. Um, but what she saw occurring there, she said, damn, my work says that this is good for all kids. This is good for all kids. And so she worked not to dismantle that 
system, but to ensure that other kids got that same uh, work. This book is available. It is not for free, <laughs> um, but a lot of uh, uh, Feuerstein's research is also um, addressed there in the, in the front of the book. But then throughout the back of the book, a lot of the work that we've done in schools in other parts of the country um, are, are discussed. Work in San Francisco and in uh, Seattle, in uh, Buffalo, New York, etc. Well, she basically pulls this into seven um, points, right? What she calls the high operational practices, high operational practices of the pedagogy of confidence. The first thing she says is that we have to identify and activate students' strengths. What we oftentimes do instructionally is we start by giving a diagnostic test. And the intent is to do what? When we give that test, what are we trying to find out usually? Where the student is. Right, where the student is. And what does that mean, where the student is? What they know, and oftentimes it means what? What they don't know. What they don't know, which is what their education levels, right? We look at what they don't know, and that's where we start to work. But the brain actually works from the familiar to the unfamiliar. The brain looks for a connection. So you look for what somebody is familiar with and knows about, and you work outward. But in particular, if they're familiar with something, and they've practiced at that thing that they are familiar with, then it becomes a strength. And when you start from a point of strength, not only does the familiarity enable the brain to grasp the concepts more so, but it also makes you feel better. And so you start secreting those neurotransmitters or firing those neurotransmitters that, that cause you to feel good because you know this. It's your strength. And that enables you to go into the areas that you don't know. So we always say begin with student strengths. Building relationships. There's a whole lot to say about this notion of building relationships because, in fact, James Comer tells us that without relationships, there's no significant learning that takes place. A lot of things occur physiologically when you are in relationship with somebody that allows you to be more present, more connected, more participatory, more trusting. But the other thing is that when we're talking about the issue of achievement gap, have you all heard about this notion of stereotype threat assessment? It's in their book. It's in their book? Good, OK. Well, Building relationships is trying to counter that stereotype threat. If I'm feeling like you are stereotyping me, even if I can't put it into that concept, I'm just feeling a negative vibe, almost at the level of the unconscious mind, I shut down. Now, the interesting thing is about stereotype threat is stereotype threat applies to all demographics in particular domains of activity. So dominant folk, males, right? you, you, you know, I say you, we can also experience stereotype threat in other areas. But then we start getting cross-racially, cross-culturally. Most frequently we think about stereotype threat in terms of African Americans and females because that was the initial research. Their math and science abilities their math and science performance. But what we find is that white males will also experience stereotype threat in particular domains of activity. The specific domain of activity that white males experience stereotype threat is around conversations about race. Because they will perceive that the person, particularly if it's a person of color, that they'll see what I don't know, that they won't understand what I'm saying, that I won't get it out right. And then what we know about stereotype threat is that then that's what happens. Building relationships is a way to shut that down, to neutralize that. Getting to know folk, understanding them, helping convey what is in your heart as their best interest. And then working with them to achieve that. Right? Um, 
I'm watching the time and I want to get into some other things. So let me pop down and let's say uh, providing enrichment. Enrichment actually grows the brain. It, it should be a no-brainer to say that, but quite literally the dendrites grow and they reach out for other neurons to connect to when you get enriching experiences because enrichment means elaboration. It means new experiences and it means elaboration. Uh, situating learning in student lives. That is such a big one. That is such a big one. We have to learn as a society, as an educational system, how to look at a student, understand them ethnographically, and then tailor our curriculum to that experience. That's time consuming. It's labor intensive. But it's really necessary if we want to beat that achievement gap. Right? I go. Ooh, I go. Amen. All right. Amplifying student voice. Amplifying student voice. When students talk, their brain grows. We don't want a quiet classroom. You want an active, vibrant classroom. We want to encourage language production to parents with young students. And we want to encourage their language production that is something that is authentically them, what they are interested in. In the school that I'm working at in Minneapolis, uh, I go there once a month, working with a, a, a small group of teachers and the principal and the equity director. Frequently, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent come in. Curriculum coordinator comes in. We realized that, well, actually, within the first month or so that I was there, the uh, one of the teachers invited me to the school dance. And I, w I stayed, I went to the school dance and they hired this local hip hop musician who's uh, all the rage. He had his whole DJ set up and these kids were loving it and they were dancing. There were Muslim girls in the full regalia but they were up and they were dancing and they were doing it and they had such big smiles. And so several months in, I learned they're gonna now have another dance at the end of the school year in May. And I said, wait a minute. We're talking about situating learning in the lives of students. Don't do that as a standalone project over here at the end as a carrot. Instead, turn that into a learning experience and have students work all year long on something that they're going to produce and demonstrate and learn more about at that dance. And so that's what we're doing now. So when I go there next in two weeks, we'll actually sit down with the hip hop musician and the teachers involved and we'll map out the curricula and the learning stations. And we got a theme already. They said, well, May is uh, Mental Health Month, right? National Mental Health Month. So they said, so let's theme it around that. So I said, like what? Healthy lives, healthy minds, healthy minds, healthy lives. They said, yeah, let's do that. So now we're gonna sit down and have the DJ construct a playlist around that theme. And we're going to have a spoken word uh, event. And we're going to have sessions where the students have to learn about the technology behind what he's doing while he's doing his DJ. A whole bunch of other stuff. We're talking about situating learning in their lives, okay? Let's bounce a little bit here. Okay, uh, five learning and teaching patterns. This comes from Augusta Mann. Augusta is also a consultant for the National Urban Alliance. Uh, this work comes out of research that she did while she was at San Francisco State University. She says all classrooms, and actually this came very specifically out of her work looking um, at African diaspora learning and teaching patterns, but the research since her initial effort showed that these are patterns that all students in the classroom benefit from. Ritual, something that we do every time we come together. My ritual was what? What did we start off doing? Qigong. And I do that every time when I come into my classes. If I don't, then we're off that day. But there's many, many, many other rituals. Some folks just simply have uh, you know, a, a do now activity on the board. But let's pull it out of the classroom. Who said they were going into nursing? You? Yeah. You can have a ritual every time you encounter a patient, every time somebody comes in. 
a ritual that makes that hello and that really micro encounter super special and that completely calms and connects that person with you. So you engage in repeated actions, repeated actions. Rhythm. There's a lot of ways to have rhythm. Music is obviously one of them. But there's also rhythm in your pacing, rhythm in your call and response. We've experienced a little bit of rhythm, right? I go. Amen. I go. Amen. I go. Amen. That rhythm wakes you up every couple of seconds. We jump back into it. Repetition. The brain needs repetition, but the brain doesn't need rote repetition. It needs nuanced repetition. It likes novelty. That tracking thing that contributes to the achievement gap, well, they believe in repetition as well, but their repetition is rote memorization. It's the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, and you shut down. Even against your will, you shut down. And again, we talked about relationships. Uh, five critical experiences, responding to a variety of texts. And these are daily experiences. Composing text, right? Producing language, oral and written. Sustained reading, and you, you probably all know about sustained silent reading. Maybe you have siblings or children, or maybe you experienced it yourself. But check it out. Sustained reading of a variety of self-selected texts situated in the lives of the students. Fabulous story on National Public Radio about two months ago about a young man who used to, well, when he was a young man, only thing he really wanted to read were auto magazines. His mom said, OK, let's read the auto magazines. But guess what? you got to tell me about it, and I'll get you more. Now, you think about it, if he was carrying around the auto magazine and that's what he was reading during sustained silent reading time, I know that for a fact there are some teachers that would shut that down and say, you've got to get a book. Well, this man ended up being an auto designer for Ford, and they say he's responsible for two out of every five car designs you see on the road today. Studying and mastering language patterns. And that comes down to what? That comes down to English, if in fact English is not your first language and you're gauging English. It comes down to academic language, and we're all academic English learners. But it also comes down to critical literacy, and that's going to be really, really important. And then this notion of learning how to learn, right? What are your study strategies? How are you reading? Are you using resources? What do you do when you get stuck? Things of that nature. I know we want to get to questions soon, so I'm going to jump forward. And I want to talk about George Lakoff, because this is really important work. And this is where a lot of my work is focusing right now, OK? Um, George Lakoff, I began reading initially when I was an undergrad several decades ago. Um, he wrote this book called Metaphors We Live By. And his whole thing was that. Metaphors are not just poetry devices, literary devices. Metaphors actually are in our everyday language. They're in our everyday language, and they influence our thinking and our behavior. He said, for example, up is always associated with good things. We think of heaven, right? We think of our emotions. I'm feeling up. I have a lot of pep. Bad things always associated with down, right? Well, these are in our language all the time. Well, nowadays, he says that we can map out all of our metaphors, and we can not only map out all of our metaphors, we can map out where they happen in the brain through MRIs, right? So what he tells us, first of all, he says that all thought is physical. All of our thinking is represented by the neurons in your brain. It's an actual physical representation of your thoughts. Most thought is unconscious. I explained that earlier. I said I want you to keep that in mind. 98% is unconscious, so we have to begin thinking about how to educate the 98%. But he says worldviews are very complex neur neural circuits. And, and when we say worldview, we can think about culture right there. We can almost substitute that, right? Because our, our, our cultures have 
uh, a ways in which we see the world. He says, if something doesn't fit the circuitry that represents your worldview, you can't really understand it. You might reject it, you might ignore it, you might ridicule it. This is why when we're teaching, we have to begin with what people know, to connect with what they know, to then take them into what they don't know. If you just come across uh, up against something that you don't have the circuitry for, um, there's, a, there's a communication breakdown, all right? So stay with me on that. Contradictions in our worldview exist, right? None of us are just one specific thing, 100%. We have a range of perspectives, even if we have a dominant perspective. That's represented by what they call mutually inhibitory circuits. When one is activated, the contradictory one is shut down. It doesn't operate. So activating one circuit shuts off the other. Conversation about your worldview strengthens it, particularly when the language is rep uh, repeated. Okay, when you repeat it, it's activated a bit, but when you have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of nuanced repetition, different areas of your brain fire toward that experience. And those neurons start looking for each other. And at some point, they grab hold of each other and they form a, a complex circuitry, what we might call your hardware, right? So I want to talk about the political piece of it right now because this is directly related to the idea of achievement gap. It's directly related to culture and achievement. Donald Trump has 24 million Twitter followers. Do we know that? We knew he had a bunch, right? That's the number that Southern Poverty Law Center points out. When he sends out a message, that goes out to at least that number of folk. But what happens when you get a tweet, those of you who are on Twitter? If you like it, what do you do? You retweet it, right? You send it out. So that right there means that at least 24 million people or some, some component of that 24 million folk are sending that message out again and again and again and again. And so it's all over the place, right? Well, if you watch the news media, they're oftentimes now trying to debunk a lot of that stuff, right? But what Lakoff and Neurolinguist tell us is that you are, even when you are trying to debunk it or analyze it, because you too are repeating it, you're strengthening that message. And you're doing it in a nuanced way because his stuff went out in tweet and in a retweet which caused people to talk about it. The news media now gives you a, a visual. They're trying to analyze it. Sometimes they roll tape, right? So you hear him or, or somebody else speaking about it. And then the news cycles throughout. They cycle throughout. So you get this endless form of repetition. What that means, friends, is that that communication, those messages, are quite literally causing your brain to develop hardware associated with that information. Now, what class is this? Social emotional development. The young ones don't even have their brains fully formed. So the young ones right now are having the hardware of their brains shaped around that level of repetition. Okay? That's what neuroscience tells us, neurolinguistics. I 
think we did that, right? Yeah. So, Southern Poverty Law Center. Every year, every election cycle, they put out a survey to teachers and school personnel, and they say, how are the kids experiencing the campaign? After the election, they say, how are the kids experiencing the election? This time around, the focus of the responses from the uh, survey takers focused mostly on Trump. So they called it the Trump effect. Let me tell you real quick what they said. Wait, wait, did I want to go there yet? I didn't want to go there yet. Um, there's a slide missing. 10,000 people, teachers, administrators, school nurses, counselors, social workers, responded to the uh, report. They said that there has been an increased number of uh, incidents of violence, right? Increased number of um, racial, gender, religious, negative statements, sometimes threats and a generalized amount of anxiety. Now, I can tell you, even without those reports, I'm in schools all over this region. I have many different projects in the San Juan Unified School District, here in Sacramento, parts of the Bay Area, Minneapolis, Buffalo, a little bit down south, and I can say it's happening. Anecdotally, it, it, it is happening. So. And here's where I'll, if we characterize some of that conversation, right, you know what a speech act is? A speech act is an utterance considered as an action, particularly with regard to its intention, purpose, or effect. That's a linguistics term, right? These are how I categorized the speech acts that are coming from our president. Contrary speech. Oppositional speech, discrediting speech, threatening speech, criminalizing speech, and demoralizing speech. I didn't say criminal speech, criminalizing speech, right? This is what's out there. This is what's out there. This is what's out there. And this is what is literally causing the hardware of our brains to grow toward, okay? You all have a big job whether you go into teaching, nursing, counseling, what have you. You have a big job to do in countering this with our students, and you only have less than 2% of their attention. Their conscious mind, if they only have 2% to give you, and they're experiencing this degree of anxiety and distraction, even on a daily basis, you'd have less than 2%. So this is what I call a pedagogy of resistance or resistance pedagogy strategies. And this is my last slide, so I'm actually going to end right at that moment so we can take some questions. The first thing, and this comes directly from Lakoff, he talks about the importance of framing, understanding the frames, because the frames that get asserted, they shape the conversation. And there may be some things to say that are outside the frame that you were given. Frames have uh, two categories of elements. They have roles or actors. And they have scenarios or practices or activities. And the person who asserts that frame is going to give you a limited number of roles and a limited number of activities for you to cognitively process. We have to have our students and we ourselves have to understand and look for at all times what are the frames that are being asserted by others and what are the frames that are being asserted by me, okay? Selectivity, we've got to monitor our exposure to certain digital messages because the repetition is on steroids. What we are seeing in our political uh, landscape is not new in terms of uh, the rhetoric, per se. 
maybe people would argue with that, and you know, I might say, yeah, it is more intense and more derogatory. If you go back far enough, no, not really, right? But here's what is different. It's that hyper-repetition. Hyper-repetition, large part due to social media, but also due to other forms of media. So, help folks pull back sometimes. Choose an alternative. I'm a news junkie. It's really hard for me. I, I go across all different stations from leftist news sources to some of the more uh, conservative stuff. I want to know what's out there. What are people saying? But that's, right, that affects me too. So I have to consciously pull myself back from it. All right? Uh, mindfulness practices. What did we start with again? I forgot what you call it. Yeah, that's a Qigong practice, right? Even this shaking that we did, that was Qigong too. And we would do it for a, a more extended period of time. But I can always look at people's faces and tell that this brought them to a calmer place. There are all kinds of mindfulness practices. You don't have to do that. You can just try this. Stand up, everybody, real fast. Up, 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 real fast. Just bounce on your toes. Not everybody's bouncing. Not everybody's bouncing. There's a physiological uh, response that's taking place when you do this that refreshes and causes you to be able to focus again. And it's not uh, affiliated with practices that might cause some to feel uncomfortable. Go ahead and have a seat. Questioning is going to be really important. Questioning, rigorous, rigorous, relentless questioning. You have to get our, your students, your patients, your clients, your family, your friends, your children to always ask why, how come, to the point that it really drives you crazy. Because right now, we're in an era where why and how come is not uh, encouraged. Okay? Trust me is encouraged. It's going to be great is encouraged. But we have to get into the questioning. We have to get to, uh, I'm going to jump ahead and, and jump over the next one for a moment. We have to get to the evidence. All right? We need folk to be acting on things that they see and feel and hear and touch. And then we need to speculate on those things that we are able to see, feel, and touch. But we have to encourage folks to have evidence, not just what someone said. Bless you. So let me jump back to this middle one, and then I definitely will stop. Self-affirmation. Self-affirmation is very important, not just because it kicks off endorphins and makes you feel good. That's one thing. But when you do feel good, you're more present, you're more engaged. But the reason why it's really important for us to affirm right now, I'm going to do a little experiment. Right now, this is what we're hearing. I don't have a hand in front of your face. There's no hand right here. There's no hand in front of your face. There's no hand. There's no hand. You don't see a hand. You're hearing things like that out there. And if you hear that over and over and over and over, you will believe there's no hand in your face. You'll think it's something else. Or maybe you'll look between my fingers and feel like your, your, your vision is obstructed because there's something wrong with your eye. That's what is out there right now. Now, I will say another reason for the achievement gap. Kids of color have been experiencing that all the time. We have to affirm. We have to affirm. I want to close by having you turn to somebody next to you and give them a positive affirmation. Right now, please. <laughs> I go. <laughs> what questions can I answer? What's on your mind? Yes. So the attention grabber, where, what does it mean? Is there like a diagnosis? Is it 
Ago Ame, yes. It comes from West Africa, from, from Ghana. Ago is, I have something to say. Okay. I need your attention. Ame, I'm ready to give you my attention. I wasn't sure if that was yeah. the definition or if you were just using that. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's, like, it's, 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 a, it's a translation. Yeah, okay. ask, so I was yes, they will. Yes, they will. And that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Others? I, I wasn't sure if you were going like this or you're asking. Go ahead, please. Well, um, it's kind of personal, but like, what ethnicity are you? I'm just like super curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, my parents came out of uh, pre-Civil War North Carolina. My great-great-great-great-grandparents. I, uh, far back, I trace them to uh, 1835, right? So I'm African-American. Obviously, you know, I'm dusted up with some other things, too. <laughs> There's history there. We didn't even talk about epigenetics. That's a whole other topic. But yeah, uh, my um, uh, great-great-grandfather on the other side was a professor of engineering at Tuskegee University in the South, historically black college. I have a question. Yes. How, do you, how any suggestions for working with parents and how to get the parents involved with children whose culture may not match the school? Code? Yeah. Um, first, we have to talk to them, right? I mean, we have, to, we have to talk to them. There's a great um, home visit nonprofit here. You're familiar with it? What is it called? The Home Parent oh, Child? I, you know? called, um, I just know that as a teacher, you can get not credential grant. I believe it's licensed. Yeah, they give you a certificate. You can, like, legally ask to go visit in the home, and it's not contradicting work. Right, right, right. That, that organization does a presentation here for the credential students and they certify them to do that because they have to go through a process. Um, so that's really the, the thing is, is get out and get to the parents, really. Go see them. Um, we did a project in Oakland Unified where I taught an ethnic studies class to ninth graders. Um, it was a very unique project. It was a class where I had two co-teachers one was a uh, recently retired uh, prison guard from San Quentin, and the other was a recently um, paroled inmate. Both had been there for 35 years in that same location. And we did a, uh, the focus of the class was on disproportionate minority contact, um, which is a term that came out of the Office of um, Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. We saturated them with lots of information and then said, what are we going to do about it? And the kids said, let's establish an education campaign. And so we created three tiers of education. The first was at home with the parents. The next was with the peers. And the third was with policymakers. There's actually a video on Vimeo. Uh, actually, it's on my website. You probably get to it there easier. I think it's called uh, Innocent Voices or something to that effect. Uh, but we had the students write scripts as to what this was, what was disproportionate minority contact, what they could be doing to avoid it and disrupt that, and what their parents could do to help them with that. We had them write the scripts, and then we had them rehearse the scripts. We did a strategy where we called it a step up and step in, uh, where they would have some dialogue about some idea that they were engaged in, and then we would take them uh, they would volunteer somebody from each group, and they would have to step up to the front of the class and then step into the class and share their script and share their information so that after a while they could go, boom. And then we had a policy forum. This is, again, it's all documented on this video, uh, where we brought in um, some of the uh, uh, local board of supervisors in that area of Oakland, um, other nonprofits, other grades, and also parents. And the, the students presented this information that way. So um, that's, that's a narrative of one way to do it, too. But it's really, it's really reaching out to them, really. Uh, something else? All right. Well, I thank you for your attention and for your presence. Um, and go do good work in the world, OK? Wherever you are, go do good work in the world. Thank you.